I'm Hi ready. there. This is Jean Roman with For Dragonflies and Me. Thanks so much for joining me at this week's podcast. As always, I'm super excited to be here sharing gardening, cooking, organizational tips and tricks, chatting about healthy lifestyles, and of course, having conversations with incredible entrepreneurs. Today, I have a really special guest. So let's welcome Chef Dennis D. Stortz, culinary artist and founder of You Can Cuisine. So Chef Dennis has a really interesting backstory. And uh, he started sharing a kitchen with his mom and two Polish grandmothers when he was about five years old. His ethnic background was su has supplied him with a canvas on which he has trained his palate. After working in several different industries, including automotive foundry and factory work, he decided to let go of the money and security to follow instead his passion for cooking and sharing his culinary experience. It was a scary proposition. He already had a wife and a child and leaving a $13 an hour job for an entry level position in the food industry that paid less than three bucks an hour didn't seem a wise or responsible choice at that time. He followed his passion anyway, graduating with a degree in applied food science from Macomb Community College's culinary department. Chef Dennis has been a professional chef for over 40 years now. He has worked in many venues in the restaurant business, from fast food to four-star gourmet, owner and chef, and as a founding chef instructor at the Baker Culinary Institute of Michigan in Port Huron, Michigan. He currently offers private food business consultation and catering and home-cooked coaching, along with a fun cooking classes focused on saving time and money. Chef Dennis is fond of reminding everyone to savor the food you eat. So Dennis, I am so happy to talk about not only cooking with you today, but how you incorporate gardening with it. Welcome, Dennis. Well, thank you, Jean. It's it's a it's a privilege uh, uh, to be with you finally. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's been a minute. We've been trying to do this for a hot minute, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel extremely privileged that you have taken time out of your very busy schedule to share your culinary knowledge, along with how you incorporate your gardens with all my wonderful listeners. So if Dragonfly friends, you know, as always, I love to give a little backstory. Uh, and I want to do so on how I came to know Dennis. Well, it's kind of funny because it was actually through his wife. Also a past podcast guest, Kat Stortz of Rocking Your Path. You might've recognized that last name. Well, I was attending Kat's writing group and that's when I met Dennis at their home. I had known all along that Dennis was a chef and taught culinary classes. And when he mentioned that he would be interested in chatting with me here on my podcast, I felt super fortunate. Now, Dennis, 10 years later, here we are again, chatting it up about gardening and cooking. <laughs> Yes, it's it's been a while, but it's it's nice to see that we well back when I first met you, you were you were definitely heavy into gardening. Yes, still um, am. <laughs> so it's not surprising that you know that that this 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 developed into what you now have as a in your podcast. Yeah, uh, it's it's good to see that you you stayed with it, so to speak. I guess. Yeah, uh, I took a little hiatus um, there. You know, went back to school well, yeah, and just to give you. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, Dennis. We're, we'll get on track here. All right. Well, like I said, I am super, <laughs> super happy that we were able to connect and we could chat it up about gardening and cooking and how they meld together. But first, I would love for you to tell my listeners a bit about yourself and how you started cooking and got, got into teaching. Well, like you had said earlier, you know, I, I started with grandmas and grandma uh, and mom. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing about an ethnic background is, um, food was a, was a sign of love. Yes. Um, so if you, if you really loved your mother or your grandmothers, uh, you ate, <laughs> um, I can relate <laughs> and one time. I, I definitely, I, I definitely, uh, uh, I definitely ate my share of stuff and I, my, my weight and waste, um, definitely showed that. Um, I mean, I loved them dearly. <laughs> yeah, but I I was told by a culinary instructor that you 
you can never trust a, a skinny chef. I agree. So I'm I was very trustworthy. <laughs> well, I can totally relate yeah, with you there, Dennis. <laughs> but I, I, getting into teaching, I mean, like I say, you know, food was always a passion of mine. Uh, like you say, I, you know, I gave up uh, the uh, the automotive industry to to get into cooking because it was my my passion and and uh, money's nice. Um, but doing what you want to do or like to do is much more important to me than money. Uh, although money, like I say, surely, surely helps. But um, I got into teaching on a, on a fluke, actually. Um, somebody had told me that uh, they were looking for an instructor um, from, a, from Mott Community College. I was contacted, went out for an interview. She said, you're hired. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Um, and I, so I, I taught baking there for uh, about four semesters. Um, and I, I enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, it was nice to be on the other side uh, of the, of the college um, culinary programs. Uh, and you could see how much, uh, you know, some students were really into it, some weren't, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then as far as then when I finally went to, uh, to uh, Baker College, uh, which is now called the the SIM, the uh, Culinary Institute of Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, th that was another fall into thing. I was I was looking for classes actually, and uh, one of the instructors contacted me and said, "Would you be interested in teaching?" Uh, again, I went down for an interview. I um, interviewed with the executive chef uh, or the head of the program, uh, the culinary program, anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I had no real, I, you know, I don't have any master's degree or any, I don't even have a bachelor's degree for that matter, but I had years of experience. So, mm -hmm. um, I, he looked at that and, uh, the two of them got together, uh, came back immediately, about five minutes later after discussing and said, this is what we can offer you. When can you start? Uh, <laughs> that's awesome. Oh. And that was that was uh, before they were just building the building uh, for the sim uh, for the culinary program. So when I started teaching, I was in a um, a church kitchen with no makeup air. We had and it was a summer class that I started with. So it's in August, and we're looking at you know 103 degrees temperatures in the in the in the uh, kitchen and. And uh, we're, we've got like five uh, fans going on us. Oh my gosh. Uh, but again, uh, I instilled in my students that, you know, um, you got to enjoy cooking. Um, and that's something I try to teach in my classes online is that, yeah, there's a lot of work to keep to cooking, uh, but you can make it really, really interesting and you can make it fun. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it's just, you got, you got to know the ins and the outs and you, you know exactly what I'm talking about, Gene. Yeah, um, I do. You know, things like, you know, growing your own herbs and, and, uh, and your own garden and, and picking that fresh tomato, uh, or going out in the garden, grabbing that fresh basil or uh, some dill to make, you know, a, a dill sauce for something. It's, mm. it's, it's great. Yeah, and, my mouth uh, is watering, Dennis. <laughs> <you know>. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do a great seared salmon uh, with a cucumber dill sauce. Ooh, ooh, that sounds super oh. yummy. That's that's the cucumber you got out of your garden, the dill you got out of your garden as well. <laughs> yeah, nothing is better than something. I don't I don't make cooked. my own sour cream yet. Oh well, that's that's a little more challenging yep, and time consuming. Sure. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, that's, that's incredible, you know, and, and you see where you are right now, but I can totally relate to like, you know, the ethnic background. My grandmother was pure French and my grandfather was pure Ukrainian. My grandfather was actually straight from the Ukraine and they came into Canada in Saskatchewan and then he came into Ontario. So I'm, I'm actually the second born uh, gen Canadian uh, generation, but you know, my grandmother made homemade pierogies and I know I gave you um, my cookbook and I uh, told you about my grandmother's yes. cookbook preps recipe. And so that heritage, you know, with cooking really does go deep. And, you know, with all that being said, you know, let's chat a little bit about that background as, you know, as you're, as you were a culinary educator, you know, share with my audience why you chose that career path for yourself, you know, and, and share where you've been and where you're at now. Well, again, I, I guess it was because I watched my my uh my mother and my, and my grandmothers um it they got enjoyment out of out of doing what they were doing um it was i guess the best way to put it um it's it's a pride kind of thing mm -hmm. um i i get um what's the word I'm looking for? Um, a sense of gratification. Uh, that's, that would, that would be good. Yes. Uh, adrenaline shots as well. Oh, okay. Um, I'm, I'm what they call a, uh, a hands-on chef. Uh, I don't, I did, I never did just sit back and watch and, and, and when I was owning my own restaurant and any of the restaurants I was executive chef in, um, I, I, I wanted to teach by way of showing. Um, and I'm also one of these chefs that used to go out into the dining room and, and I would talk to my clients I love that. Um, and see how things, see how things were. And um, again, I, i can get kind of wordy. So there were times they'd have to, one of the waitresses or waiters, uh, wait staff period, I guess, <laughs> uh, would come out and say, uh, uh, chef, you're uh, you're needed in the kitchen, uh, <laughs> you know, because you get you get to know some of these patrons, and you know they want you to sit down and have a drink or whatever the case may be. Um, uh, I've been, uh, like we said earlier, from fast food to uh, fine dining. Um, you know, you you speak of French background. Uh, I w I worked at a place called the Village Club in Bloomfield Hills. Mm. Uh, and it was a it's a private women's club um and there we did french cooking mm. uh, so if you didn't if you didn't like uh butter and cream uh <laughs> you didn't you didn't eat them <laughs> what do they say dennis butter butter and bacon make everything better <laughs> that's right that's, that's right, right. Well, my i'm wife going to the grave bacon, with that <laughs> my wife says bacon is yeah <laughs> yeah my wife says bacon is a is a food group all of itself I agree. Cat's a smart um, lady. But, <laughs> um, but I, I went from there to uh, to um, owning my own restaurants. Mm -hmm. uh, I ended up like most a lot of restaurants these days. Uh, well, especially now since COVID hit us. But um, the restaurant business is is, is a rough business um, to be in. Mm -hmm. uh, people figure, well, it's it's there's nothing to it. You just you know, uh, open up a kitchen and you serve food. Well, that's not quite how it works. Not you at know all. Exactly what I'm talking. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, and then I I enjoyed how I got into teaching end of it was when I was in the restaurants. Uh, even though I was even when I was um, a peon, so to speak, in the, in the <laughs> back of the house, um, I I like to share the knowledge that I had, and you know. If you can make something easier for somebody, you know, why not tell them, you know? Yeah, um, for sure. It's all those, about those tips and tricks. Even, you know, yeah. this is how you handle a knife. Exactly. Exactly. So I found that, you know, I really enjoyed that end of it. Um, and then when I was at the village club, I was also in culinary school at that time. Um, and I ended up becoming one of the, uh, one of my instructor called me. I was a student instructor. So we had like 40 students in our class, one of the classes, and he would, half of the class would come 
I would be their instructor, so to speak, um, which made me, believe it or not, uh, Gene, it made me a lot better because I was telling students, my fellow students, how to do something or mm -hmm. giving them information. And if I was incorrect, when it came time for testing and instead of getting that B, they got a D. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not a good thing. Yeah, guess who they came looking for? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine it, it probably gave you an opportunity to learn the skills that you later used, you know, in teaching your classes. Yeah, there was also a downfall to it because I was, I got really cocky where I was working. And um, just, just as a real a side thing real quick, I went in one day and um, I, w I became a sous chef not too long after I had, about a year after I had been in the uh, village club. Uh, and I walked in one day and the, and the chef said, uh, uh, Dennis, go grab those bushel of beans. And he said, you know, pick those beans. And I kind of looked at him like really weird. Like, you want me to pick beans? <laughs> so I did. Um and I picked a, a bushel of beans um, and I went into him later and I said, you know, Randy, I said, what was the deal? He goes, because, you know, you're doing really well, Dennis, in school, but I run the show here. <laughs> yeah, you got to get back in your place. <laughs> you know, um, but that's that's when I decided, okay, that's when I, I wanted to get into teaching. Um, and I, that's, that's the part I love best. Um, don't get me wrong. I love cooking, uh, but I love sharing my knowledge. Um, because it, it comes, it comes genuinely. Okay. And that's, yeah. I think that's something that I, I found through my, my college career. Um, that not all instructors are genuine. A lot of them are just there because it pays good money. Yeah. Um, or at least it did then. I don't know what it pays now, but probably better. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> you might have to go back and but, look into that, um, huh? <laughs> yep. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but, you know, because I even used to challenge my instructors. Um, and that made them better. Um, it also uh, made me, uh, the, my, my fellow students made me, uh, they voted me student of the year. Uh, <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, because I, I took on a, our sanitation instructor uh, one day. Uh, we were talking about pork and he said, well, you can't serve pink pork. And I said, yes, you can. And he said, no, you absolutely can't. So we, we went into the kitchen the next class and I um, I said okay. I said now I'm I'm gonna cook this, and I'm gonna leave it alone. And, and you do what you have to do. You temp it, you temp it, so that it comes up to the proper temperature, and then you cut it and you tell me what happens. Um, so the class is all around him, and I I cooked it. I temped it obviously because I um, wanted to make sure I knew what I was doing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and I said okay. I, I gave it back to the instructor and I said, okay, I said, now you, you temp it uh, and tell me, is it, as far as you're concerned, is it, is it up to temperature? And is it, can I serve it the way it is? And he said, yep, it's up to temp. I said, now cut it. So he did. And sure as green apples grow, uh, it was pink on the inside. Okay. And he goes, Dennis, he goes, congratulations. He said, you know, you just got an A in the class. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's quite a testimony too, you know, and it's like, and now, you know, look at where you're at now. It's like where now you are instructing, you have taken those skills and that knowledge and built your, you can cuisine now. And I think that's, that says a lot, you know, and it makes me think back to, to you know, our, our initial phone conversation when you mentioned you got to meet Julia Child at an event. And that was one of the things I was really excited to talk about during this podcast. Tell my listeners about that experience, because it really I was like, that was so cool. <laughs> Not everybody gets to meet Julia Child either. Well, 
it was i mean it was a, it was a quick experience i mean we didn't get to cook together or anything uh but when i was at the village club um it's um again it's a private women's club and at that time um it was what they called old money oh yeah uh for those of for those out there who don't, don't understand old money it's like you know mom and dad had it gave it back gave it to me uh, that kind of old money, it just, it's been in the family for years, as opposed to new money where, you know, I developed the, the hula hoop and now all of a sudden I'm a millionaire. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but um, one of the ladies, uh, members of, of our club, uh, knew Julia Child well, and she did a, um, like a house sharing in the summertime. Okay. So, uh, her and her family would go to Julia's house and uh, Julia would then come to her house in Bloomfield Hills. And um, we were doing some appetizers for this lady. Uh, so the chef and I went out to the house and Julia Child had just gotten there uh, the day before. So I got a chance to, to, to meet her and, uh, and uh, you know, say hi to her and uh, it, it was just a great experience. Like I said, we didn't we didn't share any cooking knowledge or anything. I'm sorry to say, um, but it, it was just a, a thrill to be able to meet the lady. Uh, did I you mean, cook for her just, though? Well, did you get the opportunity to cook for her? We did appetizers for it. Okay, yeah, we did appetizers for it. Um, and I just from word of mouth from. The, uh, the lady who owned the house, who went, eventually when she came back, shared with us that Julia appreciated and enjoyed the appetizers that we made. Oh, so, um, that's so cool. That, that was kind of cool. But like I say, it was just, just to be in the presence of, a, of, of, a, of Julia. The, she's, uh, yeah, she's a legend. <laughs> I mean, yes, yeah, she is, yeah, just, and I've, I wish I'd had her cookbook time with me. I could have got her autograph. autograph yeah, uh, but... <laughs> for sure. Yeah, but you know, that's still, it's still a cool story. And no, I think, but... you know, just having the opportunity to chit chat with her for even a couple of moments and knowing that she ate your food, you know, and then she complimented on it. That's so cool. And, you know, while we were determining what, you know, in our initial conversation, when we were determining what direction we wanted to take this podcast, I was so excited when you suggested incorporating the gar gardening aspect in with the cooking, because my initial thought was, you know, I wanted your feedback and, and thoughts on cooking, you know, being in the kitchen, ethnic cooking, and then, you know, teaching classes and whatnot. But, you know, of course, cooking and gardening go hand in hand for both you and I and for many people. And so that's kind of what I want to chat about now. Um, and you mentioned that, you know, you have your herb garden and that you really do that. And I think we talked a little bit about, you know, you were going to give my listeners a little tutorial on dry versus fresh herbs. So let's, let's, uh, let's move in that direction. Okay. Um, yes. Um, uh, I even uh, most of the restaurants I worked at, we had our own fresh herb gardens. Uh, we made sure of that. Um, there's nothing like fresh herbs. No, um, there's not. <laughs> and how I how I really got back into herbs um, was several years ago when all of a sudden people started um, cooking healthy. Mm -hmm. um, not that, you know, they shouldn't have been doing it earlier, but, um, you know, you're, you're eating more chicken, you're eating fish, you're, you know, um, you're not eating the greasy deep fried stuff. And people used to say, well, you know, it's really bland. It's like, it's, it's bland only because you don't know what to do with it. And mm -hmm. that's where herbs come in. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can make anything delicious with herbs um and the, the difference i i take i used to take um when i do my dryer my fresh herbs is i dry them out and put them in jars mm -hmm. me too um also i um uh, uh, take them and chop them up and i put them in ice cube trays with a little bit with water so that uh and then individually pop them out and i'll put them in a in like a zipper bag mm -hmm. and uh, 
So you've got fresh herbs. I'll put like a tablespoon in um, and use it, be able to use it all year round. Yeah. Um, but I also use obviously a, a lot of dry herbs because you can't grow every herb that's out there. At least I can't anyway. I don't, I don't have <laughs> well, the space. Yeah. So, um, and, and there, there and, is a lot of them. Yeah, there is. And I have, I have problems with well, basil is not a good friend. Of, I cannot grow basil. Oh my really gosh. Well really? Um, yeah. And that's supposed to be one of the easiest herbs to yeah. grow. Uh -huh. <laughs> we'll have to talk on, on the, on the side here and you're going to have to tell me what you're doing because yeah, there basil is super easy. Might be just the way you're harvesting it. That could be, that could very well be. Yeah. Because there is a specific um, way to harvest difference. it. But the, 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 and that's true. Of, uh, rosemary is another one that I, I find. Well, we're not, we don't really have the climate here in Michigan. Mm -hmm. Although I've got a friend who's got a rosemary plant in her house, never yeah. been outside. Yeah. That she's had for uh, close to 20 years. Yeah, you and can. It's a bush. I yeah, mean, you can just, definitely you know, overwinter them if you in indoors for sure. Well, I, I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk. <laughs> but, but, for, but for those who, who, you know, don't have access to fresh herbs and fresh herbs to buy them in a, in a, in a market, a uh, supermarket, uh, they're outrageously priced and God knows what they actually did with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and you don't get much for your money either. No, you do uh, not. But that's a whole nother story. Uh, but so most people would be using dry herbs. And most people don't realize that dry herb versus fresh herb. You would think a fresh herb, like if I were going to use a, a recipe called for a tablespoon of, let's say, basil. Mm -hmm. And I, I use fresh, I use that fresh basil, one tablespoon full. Now, Come wintertime, I don't have that fresh basil. It still calls for a tablespoon of fresh basil. But the dry basil is more potent than the fresh basil. And that's true of all herbs, mm -hmm. which doesn't really, when you think about it, it really doesn't make sense. You'd figure the fresh herb would be much more potent than a dry herb. But the dry herb is more, well, for lack of a better way to put it, concentrated. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, uh, you would cut, if it was one, one tablespoon of fresh herbs, fresh basil. Now you'd only want to use a half a tablespoon of dry basil. And when, when I found when you work, I learned it from one of the, one of the, uh, my culinary instructors, uh, when you're using dry herbs, if you put them, I put them in the middle of my palm and I take my other hand and rub it together, the two palms together, so that I'm heating it up, so to speak. Yeah, heating the oils, um, yep. Exactly, you're bringing out the oils, which is be more flavorful. Mm -hmm. That's why a lot of recipes will tell you uh, to put the herbs in, let's say you're making, I don't know, uh, spaghetti sauce. Um, and you've got the ground beef, in it and um they tell you to put the the dry herbs now in <clears throat> excuse me in with the beef so that it's heating it up and the oils can can uh extract from the from the dry excuse me the dry part of the herb right. uh, and now it's more flavorful um and to test it they can you can take um a dry let's say a, again let's use basil open up the, the jar of dry basil, smell it, then put a little bit of basil in your hand and then rub your palms together. Now smell that. That makes the difference. That'll, that'll show people exactly the difference it'll make in cooking. Um, and so that's that's something I, that I think is important to people using herbs. Um, but herbs are, God, they're just, they're just so important. I mean, you know, you, you can, Instead of using a ton of salt, you can make something really tasty. 
I'm yeah. not saying you're going to get rid of salt. But, no, exactly. But, you but you're right. It is a different, you know, salt and pepper enhance where the herbs, you know, provide the flavoring, in, in my opinion. That's my thought process. Yep. Yep. I mean, like I used, I used to be known for one of the things I was known for up here um, was uh, my prime rib. Mm. Um, and I did a I did a dry rub with with my uh i mean i when i first started in restaurants um when they did when chefs did prime rib they used a ton of salt over the top of it hmm. so that it was like encrusted in salt hmm. and i'm thinking why are they doing that because when you when any herb or seasoning and i'm going to use salt is an example. Okay. Salt, well, no, I don't care how much, you can pile a, a six inch pile of salt on something, but only the, it's only gonna go down a half inch. I don't care how much salt you have on it. That's as, that's as much as it's gonna happen. So the otherwise you're wasting your salt. Um, so it don't, like I say, it only goes down a half inch. That's, that's it. Okay, that's um, interesting. So why that's use, why use? Yeah, and I, I like I say, I learned that again by one of my with one of my instructors. Uh, but, but you could try it out. I mean, you know, if you if you don't believe me, <laughs> you know, so, so I didn't. So I I emphasized herbs when I did my prime rib. I did you know rosemary. I did you know thyme, uh, some tarragon, um, and. If I if, to to get back, I want to get back to to uh, the prime rib end of it. But it's it's you don't need the salt, right? Um, because, like I say, the herbs they just they enhance more than the salt will. Um, like I say, not that you're going to throw your salt out by any stretch of the imagination. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> there are herbs. There are herbs too that you know some people they take. You know, getting used to, <clears throat> I mentioned tarragon. Tarragon is one of those herbs, and, and you know as well as I do, Gene, that it's it's one of those love or hate kind of herbs. Yeah, um, it's it's, it's got a herb that, yeah, it's got a very distinct flavor. You either like it or you don't. Kind of like rosemary, in my opinion. It, it, very good, very good. Yes, uh, rosemary is that, exactly one of those. Because I'm not a big rosemary fan myself. Um, I guess I used to use it on my prime rib, but yeah. as far as, yeah. you know, and it's okay in, uh, stuffing, <laughs> you know, uh, but I'm not, a am not a big, a, a big rosemary fan. Um, but I do like tarragon. Um, but tarragon is one of those that you don't need much of to enhance. It's kind of like a saffron, um, you know, you don't need much to get the flavor uh, as opposed to where, you know, let's say, you know, again, I'll pick on basil. Uh, <laughs> you know, you may need more more basil than, um, you can use more of it to, to get the flavor you need as opposed to some other herbs. Yeah, I, I'm kind of with you on the rosemary. That's, Probably my least favorite. I really don't cook with rosemary at all. I just have a thing about it. I feel like it smells like pine. Tarragon, I do. I, I, there are a few things I do, like an, an infused tarragon uh, olive oil with garlic. And I really like that. That sounds good. Yeah, it is super yummy. Yes. Well, that, that would is be good with, uh, I do, a, I do. I was gonna say I do an infused uh, lemon olive oil. Oh yeah, yeah. I do several um, in the summertime, and I put them in ice cube trays as well. The oil doesn't like freeze like solid, solid. It's more like a like a lard texture. But like I'll do garlic with thyme. I will do and in an olive oil. 
Uh, I'll do basil with garlic. And, uh, and I also actually make a bunch of my pesto in the summer. And then I will put that in half pint jars, you know, kind of like jelly jars. And I'll put those in the freezer. Yeah. And that is a quarter cup. And sometimes I'll put them in a pint, like a half uh, or rather a half pint. That's uh, sorry, a sorry, a half a cup. And um, yeah, th that comes in handy when I want fresh pesto, linguine with pesto sauce. Wow. So you use the oil as opposed to water to, when you freeze yes. your stuff then? Yes, I do. Yeah. And then it's ready to use. Wow, that's interesting. I'll you can do it with butter that. too. can do uh, herb infused butters, which you freeze even better. And then you can do those as, as spread. Yeah, I was going to say your butter would definitely. Uh, yeah, that, I have a your blog. Butter would definitely freeze better than, your, than the olive oil would. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But it does. It's still. It, it again, it's not it's not going to like harden like the butter or water, but it gets it gets dense enough to where you can still, you know, it still uh, forms to where you can still like put it, take it out of the ice cube tray and and form it into like and then throw them into the Ziploc bags. That's something I've done for years. Oh, so you can, that, that was my next, that was going to be my next question is, will it, will it harden enough to pop out and put into, you know, uh, uh, a zip bag or whatever the case may be and put back in your freezer? Yeah. The regular olive oil seems to do it better than the extra virgin. Don't ask me why. <laughs> that, that you might know, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but it has worked for me in the past. But again, sometimes I have even used uh, little snack size bags and just thrown what I want in that with the oil and just skipped the ice cube trays altogether. Yep. And then you can snip yeah, the no, corner I've, I've out. Done that. I've done that myself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like, like you said, herbs are uh, a, a cook's and a garden's delight. And I love, you know, having my kitchen garden or my potager, you know, outside of my door. I'm so excited to uh, start my new raised bed garden for this year. And we will definitely have to uh, chit chat more about the herbs. But I would love to now chat with you a little bit about my cook book and uh, my lovingly seasoned eats and treats. And I know you had asked me for a couple recipes that I would recommend. And of course, I suggested my marinara sauce and my grandmother's crepes. Those are what I get probably the most compliments from uh, from my my readers and my people who have purchased my cookbook. And so would you uh, care to share a little bit of your feelings on my cookbook and any recipes that you've used out of it today? Be kind. <laughs> well, yes, and 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 the reason, uh, one of the reasons I, because you've got a lot of recipes in that in that cookbook. Yes. Um, but and one of the reasons I asked you is because every every well, I want to say chef, but every good cook, every cook period has their favorites. Mm -hmm. You know, I agree. It's, it's their go-to's. You know, uh, like you said, you know your your uh, your marinara sauce and your your grandmother's uh, crepe recipe. Uh, you know, those are those are go-to's. Those are things you, you know, you recommend to people. And I, I have not, I'll be honest, I have not made any any marinara sauce. That's okay. Uh, yet, uh, but I have tried your grandmother's crepe recipe. Oh, what did you think? Uh, um, it's, it's fantastic. And, you know, that's, that's another thing, you know, people, people, when they, when you mentioned doing homemade crepes at home, they, people like freak, it's like, oh God, I couldn't do that. <laughs> um, but the nice thing about it is you, you, you can, you, you really can't screw it up because you're going to roll it up and, and eat it one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even if it's half, half cracked or whatever, um, but what I did do, and I, 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 I've got, and I'm sure you have have too. I've got, God knows how many cookbooks, <laughs> um, yes. and a lot of them I bought just for, I bought just for one recipe, and I've tried the recipe, and then I tweaked the recipe. I oh, did yes. it my own way. All good you know, cooks my, do. My wife will say, my wife will say, yeah. 
you know, she says, you know, you paid $50 for that cookbook and you've never read it. I said, no, I, I, I got it for one recipe and that's what I use. Mm -hmm. But where I'm going with this is uh, your grandmother's recipe calls for uh, buttermilk. Yes. So I thought, okay. Um, and uh, I didn't have any buttermilk and uh, well, I'm like, you know, I'm sure. And maybe other people don't that, you know, you can make your own buttermilk you yes, know, you can. by using vinegar or lemon yeah. juice Yeah. Um, and just setting it out room temperature for a while. But anyway, and that's what I ended up doing. Oh, cool. Um, but I did it with, um, with the buttermilk, but I also did it with 2%. Okay. And then I did it with uh, Greek yogurt. Oh, oh, that's an interesting twist. Um, and I make, by the way, I make my own Greek yogurt. I, mean, I, I don't mean make my own Greek yogurt. I make it Greek as opposed to buying Greek yogurt. Okay. Um, and that's something for enough. And all you do is you, you, you get regular yogurt, which is a lot cheaper than Greek. Mm-hmm. And I, I put it in uh, a colander with, with coffee filters, Okay. put it in, cover it up, uh, put a bowl up underneath it so that it, it catches the, the way. And yep. uh, I leave it in the refrigerator for two days and let the whey drip out of it. And now you've got Greek yogurt, quote unquote, okay. Greek yogurt. Um, and you can, all, I keep the whey as well. I used it. Matter of fact, I, I used it in uh um, a tuna noodle casserole. That I, okay, I, very I, good. That I made. But anyway, so just to let you know, I like I say, I I, I love your grandmother's recipe, um, and um, it's just that the, I'll, I'll tell you the yogurt made it a little more tangier than okay. the buttermilk did. Okay, so I I guess you would use it for depending on what you were doing with the crepe. Um, you know, because again, uh, back to herbs, you know, you could take your grandmother's crepe recipe and add, you know, tarragon to it, and make it a savory crepe. Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I did a blog on my uh, on my grandmother's crepe recipe and definitely gave some, you know, either sweet or savory recipes to 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 do with that recipe. Crepes are so versatile. And a lot of people don't realize you don't have to have a, an actual crepe uh, maker, you can use, do it on an electric skillet or a regular frying pan. You just gotta, you know, have a big wide spatula is kind of the trick. Yep. Yep. And the secret is, it, I, I, I think if I remember correctly, I think when you, in the recipe, you mentioned the fact that, uh, the first crepe is normally scrapped. Yeah, <laughs> you got to watch for the bubbles and you kind of got to let your frying pan get seasoned. Yep, exactly, exactly, you know. Um, but like I say, that's, yeah. Um, I definitely enjoyed, it's it's a recipe I would make again. And like you say, the nice, the also, not only don't you have to have a crepe pan, but you could, they freeze really, really well. Well, I've never tried um, that. Oh, I cannot make enough, and, Dennis. When my when oh my gosh, kids yes. are all here, they want. Oh, I I just sit there and make them and make them and they eat them and they eat them. But I do um so that it kind of saves me a little time. I will take each one and individually wrap them in either uh, a wax paper or a um. Oh my gosh. Uh, help me, Dennis. What's the other kind of paper? It's a brown. It looks parchment paper. And uh, that will, yeah, then I can serve them even that way. Then I can keep them warm in an oven on a low warm oven. And uh, because if you keep them in an oven for too long, then they get crunchy and then they're not good. So. Yep. Yeah. Well, but the the way, the way you, the way you you kept them in the oven with, with, with the parchment paper, you could do that and freeze them. I mean, you can stack them up oh. and and freeze them. Um, I happen to I have a food saver, so I vacuum mm-hmm. seal them. Okay. Um, and I've I've kept I've kept six months in my freezer. 
Well, that's a good thing to know. Um, I'm gonna. I'm all about you know sp sp putting up and you know can shelves and freezers. And I never thought about that, but I have plenty enough uh, freezer space. But I cannot say how excited and happy I am that you loved the recipe, and I'm thrilled to know that you tried a different a uh, couple variations with it. That's a great tip. I actually made notes of that, and I'm gonna go back into my blog and update that and reblog it with those updates. So thank you very much. But, um, you know, Dennis, like I said, you know, when we were talking about doing this podcast, you and I could sit on this computer and chat about cooking and gardening for probably the whole day. <laughs> But both of <laughs> us have to move on as well as my listeners. And so, you know, I just want to say thank you so much for joining me here today, Dennis. Um, it has been a pleasure chatting with you. And I would love to do this again, maybe later in the year, you know, after the garden. Maybe we could even do a YouTube video together. And uh, I think that would be fun. Both of us in the kitchen making something. We'll have to talk on that. <laughs> but um that would be great yes I, I think it would be super fun Dennis we'll we'll connect on that uh off offline here but um dragonfly friends if you would like to see more about what uh chef Dennis does his products and services you can visit my blog at for dragonflies and me and of course Dennis's website at youcancuisine.com and you can see all of what he does on his site he offers a plethora of information and he is an incredible resource. But um, if you'd like more information on my cookbook, uh, you can also go to my website at fordragonfliesandme.com. And on the left uh, side of the website, you'll be able to see how you can purchase my cookbook. So with that being said, thank you so much, Dennis. It, again, has been a pleasure. Oh, thank you. I've, I've enjoyed every minute of it. And like you say, you know, I could... I could talk forever and and just again to plug the book. Uh, it's people. the The book is 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 well worth the money. Believe me. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, the book is got just under 500 pages with a thousand recipes and a hundred of those recipes are mine. And uh, it has a very extensive canning section, canning and freezing. So with a lot of great instructional information on it. So if you are looking for um, a great place to start with preserving your food, this is a great book as well. That was one of the main reasons I wanted to uh, create that cookbook was number one, to have all of my favorite recipes in one place, which is why I'm making my, you know, creating my second cookbook now because I have way more. And also number two, I wanted a resource for all of my canning recipes. And so it is that and more. But um. Until next time, if you are not following me here at my blog, visit me at fordragonfliesandme.com and subscribe so you don't miss the beat. And if you haven't visited me on Facebook or Instagram, uh, please like and follow me there for daily inspiration, recipes, and gorgeous photos. So until next time, friends, be sure to eat fresh, shop local, and happy day.